Hello, everybody. Welcome to Conversations. Today is a very special day, everybody. I'm going to be talking to Paul Hewson, and it's 30 years to the day from the day that he first stepped out into the ward as a clown doctor. What serendipity. Catch Paul Hewson in just a moment. Don't go away. It's just a conversation with a fellow clown. It's not very serious, we're clowning around. It's really just a clown Right. Hi, everybody. I'm so glad you could join us today for another Clownversation. If you're new to the Clown Spirit channel, you're so welcome. Here, we do all things clown. We bring clown to the world. My mission is to unleash as many clowns into the world as possible, and I can only do it with your help. So please hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. Subscribe to our channel to get more amazing clown videos. Hit the like button. Give us a like. Let us feel the love today. And also share this video with your friends. You never know who in your community, who in your world might be interested to know more about clowning. So today I'm going to be talking to Paul Hewson, who has an amazing career as a clown doctor, the first in Canada, uh, a pioneer in the clown theatre world also, and a very skilled and experienced puppeteer. But before I introduce you to Paul, I just want to let you know about one of our Clown Spirit Masterclasses coming up. Now, if you don't know about these, they happen in the context of our Clown Spirit Village membership. Every single month, we have a new amazing teacher giving a two and a half hour masterclass. Clown Spirit Village includes lots of other stuff too, but let me just tell you about the masterclass that's coming up. It's going to be with a fabulous Hillary Chaplin, who is just one of the most extraordinary clowns uh, working today. If you haven't seen her skit, her clown routine, uh, the classically trained actress, you can look it up on YouTube. It is really, really amazing. It's one of the funniest uh, clown routines I think I've ever seen. And we are very lucky to have Hillary teaching emotional play, Mind the Joy of Big Feelings, on April the 6th as part of the Clown Spirit Masterclass series. And you can join that for just $49 is a steal. And I'm gonna put the link in the chat right now where you can go to sign up for that and find out more. All right, that's enough of that. Let's get on to the main course. So today I'm talking to Paul Hewson, who's a professional stage street and therapeutic clown, a former student of Marcel Marceau and Etienne de Creux, he created the silent clown Alexander in 1975, also serendipitously the year I was born. And he co-founded great groundbreaking bilingual clown theater company Cirque Alexander uh, with Anita Couvret in 1977. And over the following 45 years, this company Cirque Alexander became extremely influential in the Canadian uh, clown theater scene, really bringing clown into the mainstream of Canadian culture. In 1994, he was inspired by the Big Apple Circus Clown Care Unit. We've had lots of those folks on Clownversations as well. Um, they're all very good friends on and, uh, and fans of Paul Hewson. In 1994, he founded the Therapeutic Clown Program at BC Children's Hospital in Vancouver, as, we, as I just mentioned, exactly 30 years ago to this day. Um, there's lots more to talk about, which Paul's going to tell us about. He was also a professional puppeteer for many, many years uh, with an impressive resume of TV shows and movies that he's worked on as a puppeteer. So without any further ado, I would love for you all to give a great big cheer to the amazing Paul Hewson. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, Paul. Thank you so much for coming on Conversations. Well, thank you, Barnaby. That's quite the intro. Uh, I'm I'm uh, I'm impressed with my resume. <laughs> I think it sounds more impressive than it is. 
<laughs> yeah, you did a good job yes, writing that resume. Nice, <laughs> nice job, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> well, it seems like it might have been a little bit long, but what the heck? <laughs> there was a lot to fit in there. I mean, you have had a busy life, my friend. And yes, I have. Yeah, we're very, very happy to have you on on conversations oh, today. Thank so, you. thank you for coming. Well, I'm very proud to be here because you know, I've been following your uh, conversations for quite a while now, and you've had just some absolutely wonderful people on, many of whom I know, and. Uh, the ones that I don't know, I certainly know of, and, and I have just so much respect. It's great that you're passing this along to the rest of the, the world, and it'll, it'll last. It'll, you know, it'll be there for a long time yet, so congratulations to you. <laughs> well, I, I hope it will be there a long time. You never really know with technology. Um. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're not in cassettes anymore. Uh, you know, we're a little bit beyond eight tracks. <laughs> I know, but at least those things actually exist in a solid form. Whereas this is a YouTube video that I don't know where it exists. Where does it mm -hmm. exist? Does it exist? In the cloud. In the cloud. That's where clowns live. In the cloud. The clown, the clown cloud. <laughs> um, Paul, uh, so it is 30, tell, tell us again, 30 years Absolutely. to the day, to yeah, the hour almost. Yeah, well, but by the time we finished this this uh, broadcast, it was exactly 30 years. I stepped out on the wards at 10 o'clock in the morning on the 15th of March, 1994. Now, I had been pursuing this for about a year beforehand. It took me a while to get, uh, you know, to convince my local children's hospital, regional hospital, that it, that it was a good idea. Uh, but they they bought into it, and then I had to get funding to do it. And I got funding through astoundingly through my uh, my Canada Council, our national or federal uh, arts council, uh, because I did have a history with them, which you know we'll bring up later probably. But uh, they they bought into this program, they think, and it was because of the material that I provided from the, actually the Big Apple Circus, uh, who who were the real groundbreakers in in terms of my evolution as a as a healthcare clown uh they they were pretty impressed with what the big apple circus had done and mm -hmm. at the time i applied for the grant you know i had actually never met anyone who had, did this kind of work professionally uh so it was it was uh you know i mean you, you mentioned serendipity and I, my, i've lived under a serendipitous cloud my whole life not, not without flaws but you know i was in the right place at the right time with just kind of the right skill set uh, fairly often in my life. I should clarify, I'm not the first healthcare clown in Canada, though. The, there was a program in Winnipeg that started at the same time, virtually as Michael and the CCU in New York, and they didn't know of each other. They just kind of, Karen Ridd had this idea as well, and, and it mm. kind of came out of the cloud uh, the same year, the same time, and uh, they really didn't actually meet each other for many, many years after that. But you know, I I was inspired by the the, the Big Apple Clown Doctor approach, um, and eventually I didn't know about the Winnipeg program either when I started. So, uh, but I just want to throw that out to give credit to yeah, the Winnipeg Karen. program for actually being the first healthcare clowns in Canada. They're pretty amazing. That's uh, a good history. a good clarification. Thank you for yeah, that. Well, yeah. yeah. Uh, but we have some of these folks uh, watching right now, who and they're tuning in and and jumping into the chat. Oh um, my gosh! Look at that. Holy yeah, Melissa, David. Wow. Hey guys. Uh, oh, Please and Melissa. Jump into the chat. If you haven't already, jump in. Um, mm. wherever you are, whoever you are, we'd love to hear from you in the chat. Let us know, you know, your name, where you are uh, tuning in from today. And also if you have any questions for Paul, uh, or any just comments or reactions to what he's talking about, please put them into the chat. Let this be a, a community conversation. Yeah, great. And hello, everybody. I won't necessarily be able to read the chats, uh, you know, when I'm in the middle of this, but I really appreciate all of you coming. That's for sure. I'll put some um, significant comments up on the screen. Like, um, for example, this one, Melissa says, yay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, they, they have a program, Dr. Clown in Montreal, that's that's really pretty much the flagship here in Canada. They, they're doing elder clown work and, and with pediatrics and just... Uh, you know they've got it all. They're they're hosting the NAFCO concert, conference in about six weeks. Uh, the North, the oh. North America Federation of Clown, Healthcare Clown mm -hmm. Organizations, uh, and Montreal is the best place almost in the world to do this because you know French culture is so vibrant, and Montreal is is a true French city in North America, and uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. Hi, Melissa. Melissa, <laughs> David. The clown name is Doctor Fifi. 
<laughs> David David McCullum from Bowen Island, David yeah. Langdon, wonderful clown, <laughs> Trilby and Trilby and Mr. Milton the Cat. Oh, you know, this this Bowen is like Island. coast to coast. We got Prince Edward Island, we got Bowen Island where I live on the west coast, Prince Edward yep. Island on the east coast. So, you know, Montreal, we've got all the way across Canada and you know, I see that uh, that we have some people from the states. I mean, I who else do I see there? I see uh Yeah, do we have uh, yeah. Yeah, Maybe I, we have folks from the UK and Europe as well, I'm sure. And I, I, people are going to tune in later. Some who can't make it will will, will access it through sure. the recording. So that's uh, so Paul. Let's let's um, nineteen ninety four was the start of that Doctor Clown program, but that was almost twenty years into your career already as a clown. So that's a long time. What were yeah. you doing? Where where did the um the mime training happen? How did you get into that? What was your route into clowning? Oh, it's just a simple question. Hey, just, <laughs> just cover it in two minutes. <laughs> let's, get, let's get that out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, my origin story is a, a, a pretty convoluted, actually, uh, and it, it would take a long time to tell, but I'll just try and uh, squeeze it in, shoehorn it in here. Right. Uh, I was born in the 40s. I'm now 75. So I was born into a different, whole different world than many people today. Uh, I, I had very liberal parents. Uh, my dad was a social worker. My mom was a public health nurse. So the the whole uh, they were they were very liberal people. They were very arts oriented people. Mm -hmm. um, I, I grew up without a television, um, which meant we watched movies. We go to the movie theater every week. So I saw a lot of silent film. Uh, one of the m seminal moments in my life when I was probably about eight years old, we went and saw a movie, and the short in front of the movie was actually Marcel Marceau, which is kind of odd. Uh, and and I laughed so hard, my mother had to take me out of the theater because I was disrupting. <laughs> and I had, no, I had no idea, you know, like I was used to, you know, Chaplin and and uh, and Keaton and especially Laurel and Hardy, whom I just absolutely love. Yeah. Uh, mostly because, the, uh, you know, we'll talk about about relationship later. But I mean, the duo work is just so exciting. And somehow that spoke to me uh, when I saw Marceau. And, you know, that went out of my mind for the next many, many years until I was basically an adult. Uh, so in high school, I was not academically, uh, I was not a, a good student. I was, I had an older sister who was very gifted uh, in terms of sports and uh, academics. And of course, my parents were well educated and I was just a kind of a genial underachiever. You know, I have some issues. I, I have some attention deficit issues and I'm a little OCD, to be honest with you. Uh, so, <laughs> so, you know, I was not a good student. So where I fit in was I was, as I say, the genial underachiever. So in high school, I, I was, I, I, I had a lot of fun. I was, you know, I was often, you know, I was up for just about anything. But when I grad, I graduated from high school in 1966, which is, you know, I talk about, you know, fortunate. Uh, I went to, uni I thought, oh, I'll be a scientist. I'll go to university. And I had failed university within my first week, <laughs> literally. Uh, and so I just kind of cruised along for the rest of, for that winter. But what happened that winter is I became, uh, uh, I became exposed to the counterculture, 1966, 1967, you know, right. and I right. was a different generation. I, I was on the cusp. So most of the people in my graduating class went on to university and had traditional careers. But me, I, I it just wasn't for me. So I dropped out and uh, I tried to get to San Francisco for the, for the summer of love. And I got deported from the States. I got kicked off because I was hitchhiking on a freeway. And so what I did is I went east. I went to I went to Montreal, which is you know this is one of these things that that you, you know you just can't plan. Uh, it was our hundredth anniversary of Canada being formed as a as a colonial country, and so we they had uh, you know had the World's Fair in in Montreal in 1967. Well, I was living on the streets, living in squats. But what happened that year was that the as I started to realize you know how am I going to pay my way here. So I started playing recorder uh, in the streets. I started to busk uh, outside the front gates of Expo, and and Expo that exposed me to French culture, you know, and that that started my journey going east west instead of north south, uh, which eventually led me into. I saw some incredible clowns that year. A lot of street theater in Montreal that year. I mean, this is a long time ago, yeah. but there was you know uh, Tibor Turba and Polivka and these Eastern European clowns came to Expo and they performed and I managed to be lucky enough to see them. So without understanding what what was going on there, I was moved by that and I started you know playing music in the streets and I got used to this street culture. 
Uh, and, and I went to Europe all of 1968. I went to Europe and I just busked all over everywhere. Wow. North so Africa. you were in, were you in France in 1968? I was in France during the strikes of 1968. Wow. Wow. That's a, <laughs> you know, it was just pretty, pretty weird. You know, it's, yeah. uh, it, you know, I remember, uh, I mean, I've got stories coming out both ears, but, but yeah, they, they, it was pretty impressive. There was no, there was no transportation. There were no border guards. Uh, you know, there was police everywhere and it was just, you know, it was an incredible time to be in Europe. You know, Czechoslovakia was in turmoil and, mm -hmm. and uh, Dubček and all that. So politically, that's the other thing is that I grew up in a family where we were politically really aware of, of you know, human rights, civil rights, gay rights, women's rights. It was something that was front and center in our family, something that we were, uh, we were expected to support. And of course, why wouldn't you write? So <clears throat> anyway, what, what happened was I, I came back after that year and I had some, a little bit of money from my grandfather who uh, had to go to university, which was not happening. So I tried to go back to university, but I went into a theater department, University of Victoria, because I come from the West Coast of Canada. Mm -hmm. So uh, I went to the University of Victoria in the theater department. But I was, of course, an older student by then. I had been around. I'd, I'd seen a lot of the world and, and, and so on. So here I am in first year, and really I'm at the age of the, the students that are graduating. So during that year, I was I, I never intended to be on stage, actually. I was going to do props. I, I, I'm quite shy, actually, and I, I get terrible, terrible stage fright. So I, I, that was, you know, I was just going to be backstage looking out through the wings and, and you know, helping with build the magic but not being a performer yeah but during that year they did it it was like the the era of peter brook you know and, and uh, all those people in the experimental theater so they were doing they did the marat sad and they did a multidisciplinary version of that which involved mime so they brought in a mime teacher and i audited the mime class with the senior students and discovered that i could do this right i went wait a minute i know I have the ability physically to do fixed point. I know what all the dynamics. I know that stuff somehow in my bones, and I'm not sure. I mean, that's when it just comes upon you. So uh, I was not doing well <laughs> again. I mean, I, I did pass all of my um, my theater courses, but I didn't do so well, you know, in the, in the uh, other courses. So I knew I was not getting a university degree. So I, I decided that I was going to, and, and this is kind of a hallmark in my life, taking risks, you know, I decided, and, and stupid risks, you know, my parents accepted them, but I didn't, but I don't know why, right? <laughs> but what I did was I wrote away to Marcel Marceau. I just went, okay, I got the address of his agent in New York City and uh, said, you know, do you have a school? And he wrote me back and said, Wow, fortunately, I've just founded a school. So the year before, he had founded his school in Paris, and then he did a big tour of the States, and he recruited people for that school. And uh, so he invited me in, uh, what year was that, 1970, to come to his school in Paris. So I threw up my university career, and I grabbed uh, one year's worth of the, that money. It would have get me, got me through one year of schooling, and I went off to Paris. And uh, parachuted myself, and I was married at the time, so I had my wife was with me, and she's not a performer. Parachuted into Paris, into Marceau's school, which was pretty incredible. <laughs> uh, I have to say, he's not, a, he was not a particularly good teacher personally. He was great at improv, but technique. But we did, uh, we had, you know, we had corporeal, which is the crew technique. We mm -hmm. had, you know, modern dance, uh, classical dance, we had fencing, we had acrobatics. We had three different mime teachers, uh, so it was a full immersion, and it was quite wonderful. And one of the little side of things of this, because I'm just going to mention, is that, that Robert Shields of Shields and Yarnell came uh, for a couple of weeks. He was given a full scholarship to come to uh, to Marceau School. He arrived, and, and uh, me, I see. I have this background in street theater, so I want you know, I wasn't like the austere uh, aspects of mime were not what attracted me. What I wanted the roustabout kind of thing. I was, I was heading mm. for circus for sure mm. without knowing it. So anyway, Robert came and he was like so, so dynamic. And they've just, the reason I mentioned it is because they, they've just done a film on his life, which is a very moving film. It's called My Life as a Robot. And I encourage you to, to go and search that out. It was just won some awards recently. It was just released anyway. But oh. that year, uh, you know, it was an incredible year. I was there, Marceau's for, I'm going to say about six months. And uh, at the end of that time, um, I was offered, someone from the school was forming a company in Sweden. So off I went to Sweden uh, to be in this company that actually never 
never existed. <laughs> yeah, so I got to Sweden. There was no no job for me. And so I, I uh, anyway, one thing led to another. I went off to Greece and Afghanistan, and you know, uh, it was uh, uh, you know these crazy journeys. But coming back to to Paris, I, uh, I I I knew I needed something more, and I met people from Lecoq, and Lecoq actually is probably where I should have gone in the first place. Uh, although the crew, very, very handy technique for everything yeah. that Pat, especially puppets, the crew is just like, you know, his technique is very, very useful. Mm -hmm. But I did meet people from Lecoq, particularly Carolyn Simmons, which is again, unbelievable uh, serendipity. This was, you know, 1971. And she was in a, in a street theater company, which is very, very influential, called the Palais de Merveille. And she invited mm -hmm. me to be a part of that street theater circus. She taught me how to put on, I'll call it white face, but it was yellow. <laughs> but, you know, they were, the, I consider them to be the precursor of Cirque du Soleil, just with the visuals, you know, amazing mm -hmm. stuff. There was, you know, the slack rope on the street. And so we, we just went all over Paris, uh, you know, day after day, month after month, and just did street shows. And uh, I was hired as a mime. But I was really, you know, I wasn't central to the story. They, they did a play called uh, the Fama Bob, the, the Bearded Lady. So we had, you know, fire breathers and we had jugglers and we had all sorts of stuff. But I was, I was uh, just kind of a, a, a transitional character. You know, I, I did clouds passing by and, uh, you know, they set up the slack rope and I'd put laundry on the slack rope and things like that. So that was my first indication that I was a clown. Yeah. And good, quick, you know, I, I, I Came back to Canada after two years, and uh, I got a job in Toronto with a friend of mine who had been at Marceau's and De Cruz, Paul Golan, and he was starting a mime company. So he invited me to be a part of that, which I was. And I was doing, you know, classical mime, um, kind of like, you know, Palabolus or whatever, you know, it was stage mime. Uh, and, you know, I, I was semi-successful at it, but again, always in a supportive role. I never kind of had that, that uh principal stories coming out of me. I was always supporting someone else's story. And again, I was starting to think, you know what? I don't know if I'm really a performer. You know, I don't have the, I don't seem to have the chops and then the stories to do this. So I think I'm going to go back to, to doing just, you know, technical theater. But, uh, and Paul, he, he had to, to shrink his company actually because it was not economically feasible. So I got a job in a dance company for, that was teaching in a dance school that was teaching dance to young kids. And this is where it really gets interesting because I was teaching mime and their whole, they were touring schools in Ontario, elementary schools doing dance shows. And they their, their style was they did, they had four different kinds of dance, you know, classical, modern, jazz, and folk. And in order to catch their breath and change their costumes, they needed somebody in between their acts, mm. which is the classical clown. <clears throat> job you know as you go between the acts so they can set up the the tiger cage or whatever uh so they said we really you know we need somebody to do this uh we we you know our whole company quit at christmas they were overworked and they just went we don't want to do this anymore so i thought well you know this is my last shot at at performing um you know i've never performed for kids before and uh so i thought oh i'll give it a chance you know so i i at christmas i it was just in in January, it was going to happen. So at Christmas, I went out and I got all the books in the library and I found Grok, you know, and Grok spoke to me. I thought, I like the look of this guy. I like the fact he's a musical clown. And, you know, he was very, very famous, of course. Uh, mm -hmm. So I, I, I went in and there was a, the costumer that was going out of business in Toronto. So I went in there and I rented a Sherlock Holmes coat and never took it back. <laughs> I stole it <laughs> and I took the, you know, I have some ability with, with sewing and all that kind of stuff. So I, I, I changed the cape into, into sleeves and I, you know, I, I got a friend of mine I laid down on the ground on a piece of uh, red plaid and she, she did the outline of me and I made a pair of pants and I, I made my own clown shoes and, and that, you know, so anyway, January of that year, and that was 1975, January, uh, we drove out to the, my first school, uh, you know, elementary schools can be pretty challenging. Uh, you know, you got 250 little kids from K to three mm -hmm. or four to six. And uh, so they said, okay, uh, this is the moment. So, and this is, this is, this is the key moment in my whole life of how I started to understand what clown was, was I, I went, okay, here I go. So they give me a shove and I walk out on stage and because of my mime training, I didn't just go out on stage. I walked clearly, cleanly out and stood in the middle of the stage. And the kids laughed. And when they laughed, and it was my first experience with, with children, 
I just, I, I, I turned my head, I just went, you know, why are you laughing? And that's all it was, the head without the neck, which is another decru kind of thing is, you know, set, you know, isolation and doing things cleanly, cleanly, cleanly. So I, I, you know, I just turned and looked at them and they laughed again. And then I, then I turned my body and put my hands on my hips with indignant, in, I was indignant and they laughed again and the laughter just kept coming. And so from then on, I realized I was a clown. Uh, I never looked back and I never did anything else since then. That was Alexander, Sir Alexander. Um, you know, I it. It was wow. a silent clown, completely silent. I didn't speak. And yeah. so for the next 20 years, you know, I, 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 there was a, a number of journeys. I, you know, I went to the, I bailed out of Toronto. I went, okay, because clown, clown allows you to, to incorporate all your skills, like, you know, clown, music, you know, yeah. props, um, the, you know, the, the, you can, you're allowed to fail. You succeed through failure. Right. And, and my whole life I've been kind of failing in a way, you know, uh, you know, I was not the star. I wasn't the, the academic, all these things, but it was okay because that's what the clown does. The clown invites mm -hmm. response through, through ineptitude, in, you know, in many ways. So, uh, yeah. So I went, you, would, you, would you say that clown Alexander is, um, <clears throat> more of a august low status or a high status or like doesn't really fit within those categories what a great question he, he is an august he is he's red and i'm going to use the terms red and white as they relate to lecoq uh you know the white clown is the rule bound one you got to do it this way and the red clown is the one that that is is breaking the rules and so on i slip back and forth and it, according to who i'm from like you know uh, literally, I, I in every and I've created about six different clown characters in my life, and every one of them they slip back and forth. You know, maybe you know, like when I work as a duo, generally I was the I was the red because I work with and I'm going to show you a picture here. I don't know if you can see this picture. This yeah. is my my hero. My uh, this is Officer O'Sneely, Keystone Cop. That's a woman. Uh, uh, the most gentle, gentle character, but very rule bound, very befuddled. You know, and when we met, she had no training in clown at all or theater or any intention. And she just stepped out and she's a talking clown bilingual. And in Canada, that's a pretty important thing. We could tour French and English schools. And I've I've probably performed in just about every elementary school in the whole country. But yeah, so so, uh, you know, it uh, it 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 just uh, we, that gave me a white to bounce myself off of. Yeah. I could always be the red with Officer O'Sneely around. But when I'm on my own, I have to do both, uh, you know, and you have to slip back and forth. And it's not hard to do, you know, because what happens if, 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 you, if you, you know, go into your arrogant or bossy phase, then all you're doing is inviting somebody to tell them, no, you're wrong. You're not actually a very smart person. Uh, and, and which is like, what? I'm not so, I know everything but that, you know, and, and, uh, and so on and so forth. So yeah, I slip back and forth. Um, according to who I'm with. And it's very, it's very useful because, uh, you know, it does lead to a, a clown conversation, which is the essence of why we're here is, is relationship is what clown is all about. You know, it's a, uh, it's a relationship with objects, with ideas, with conflict, mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. other, with your audience, um, you know, and, and, uh, I mean, I don't want to get into, I'm not, a, I'm a, I'm, I'm a, what I call a thrift store clown because I have no clown training. It just, it came out of my head and, <laughs> and the experience of having watched other people. Um, but I, know, it seems I you do, you do have training in that, that, that mime training that was a, such a foundational, so foundational that like you wouldn't have been able to have that moment with the children in that theater absolutely. if you hadn't yeah. walked out in with, with that. Yeah. Complete, yeah presence and yeah and that's yeah that's so true i mean i would not do it without my my mind training for mm -hmm. sure you mm -hmm. know and the fact that i like observation is a really huge part of, of clowning as well because you're you're, you're over the footlights you know m most of the time you don't have a have the fourth wall so it's not it's not presentational it's it invites you in it's conversational not presentational right and and the way that that works is through for me is is what happened was, and I, I wrote a little little article on this years and years ago called The Power of the Pause, because what happened was when I stepped out there, and, and many clowns fall in, and especially clown, you know, when you're in a group, when there's two clowns, you play with each other, da 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 da, da. you know, you're not going, you know, it's got to be much cleaner than that. Well, you know, the crew used to say one thing at a time, 
you know, the head without the neck, you know, you got your head, and then you got your neck. And, you know, and so one thing at a time, just and what happened was when I stepped out, my training kicked in and I didn't move my whole body. I didn't just go, oh, what's going on? Why are you laughing at me? I went, huh. And I turned my head and gave that perplexed look. Wait a minute. Yeah. You're laughing, you're laughing at me. Right. And another laugh comes. So what that does is that sets up the dynamic of a conversation. Because if you're doing all the time, it's not a conversation. So, I mean, when I talk to clowns who are, you know, asking me for my advice, I go, especially in hospitals, which we'll get to. But, you know, if you're doing all the time, there's no no room for anybody else to be in there. And that's the, the key is you want the connection. You absolutely need the connection. And, you know, it's not hard. All, it's, all it takes is to have discipline to shut up and let them react and then react and of course a clown's reaction is is unusual you break every and this is from jan henderson one of our great clown teachers here in canada uh you know you break it the clown breaks every rule but his or her own and so you know you, your reaction is going to be unusual it's going to be unorthodox it's going to be not logical probably but without that discipline of, of giving the space for the person to react you know, and then when you get into healthcare situations, it's really important to let people you know, have their voice heard mm. and give them that calm space to uh, to feel comfortable enough to do that. Yeah, let's we'll get into the healthcare clowning in in just a moment. But there's a couple of questions that have come through on the chat that I'd love to maybe address. Um, David says, um, "Well, maybe this isn't a question, but he says I love how you and others." you have encountered didn't necessarily have the academic pedigree for clown, but had the sensibility, heart mm. and personality for clown. <laughs> yeah. Well, pedigree. I like that word. <laughs> I sound like a purebred dog. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually a well, mongrel. <laughs> it's really interesting that you say um, that you had this life that felt like um, the, that you were sort of the underdog. I mean, you described that in relation to your to your mm. older sister and maybe somewhat to your parents and then yes. dropping out of university. And it's like, yeah. but this this fits clown per perfectly. perfectly. Doesn't it? Doesn't it fit perfectly? It does. And, you know, I never consider myself as the underdog because that's, that's the white clown coming in. I'm not the underdog. Mm. Me? I'm successful. Look, I know all this stuff. <laughs> yeah. You know, I can I can put three balls in the air until they all fall on my head, right? You know. <laughs> so, <clears throat> yeah, uh, it's uh, you know, it's it's pedigree. <laughs> but what this actually is really, really important aspect. To, you know, I thought about what I wanted to say here today, and one of the aspects of my of my my life uh, is I love people that are disadvantaged. I love being with people that are on the fringes. You know, mm -hmm. when I, I've done a lot of street performer festivals, I was there when street performer festivals were created. And so, you know, these are people that can pull in three, 400 people, big crowd, you know, you got seven balls in the air and you're standing on, on you know, on a 10 foot pole or whatever. Uh, <clears throat> and there, there are all these little kids at the back of that crowd that can't see what's going on. And that's who I'm playing to. You know, someone comes along in a wheelchair. That's who I'm going to go to, you know. Uh, you know, someone I've performed up north in Canada quite a bit. And these are places that I went to places that don't get three a theater. That, you know, Newfoundland, my first tour as my company in 1977 was to Newfoundland. And mm -hmm. uh, we had not one booking. And what we'd go, we'd go into every little town and uh, and we'd rent the fish hall, which is their little community hall, you know, and we'd rent it. And then Officer Osnia and I would go out. I ride the unicycle. We'd get dressed up and we'd go out and we'd advertise the show just by doing a parade down the main street, which was usually a dirt street. And Officer Osnia would hand out tickets. You know, you, you know, you have a tooth missing. You know, you, I'm sorry, that's an infraction. You know? And on that would be the advertisement. It was just a little Xerox sheet. Um, that would be the infraction and it would have the information for the show. And what we said was anybody can come to the show. If you can't afford it, you can come in for free. And we charged a dollar to get in. And we reached over 10% of the population of Newfoundland in that summer, which actually is what catapulted me into becoming the first uh, first clown that was accepted by the Canada Council as a professional artist. That's a great, because, yeah, great, great. Because they had, that summer, they had a little bit of extra money. They had mm. like 500 bucks. And I, uh, you know, I had a, a, a friend who was a puppeteer in Newfoundland, Chris Brooks, who he was a very supportive of clown. 
And he heard about me because I was in Nova Scotia at the time. I was working with a puppeteer, Ron Wagner from Maritime Clown and Puppet Company. And, uh, you know, it was his first clown show and it was my first clown partner. Uh, so I was suddenly understanding what clown was really all about. Mm -hmm. When you get a partner, you understand what clown is really all about. Well, that's super interesting. It, it forces you to be to be clean in, in your communication. But anyway, so uh, I decided, you know, uh, I contacted him. And he said, well, you know, we got a little bit of extra money. The Canada Council has a little bit of extra money left over. Here's 500 bucks. And that was the first time they ever, ever, ever gave money to a clown. Well, that, pop, that tour was so... <laughs> So successful. It was written up in. And that was the last time they gave money to a clown, right? <laughs> yeah, first time. You know, and and because they didn't understand, it was just entertainment. You know, you should be at the fair. You're not going to be in the theater. No, right, of course not, right. right. But what we were doing is we were taking because clown is real theater. I mean, it, we carried theater on our backs for a long time in this in this world. So. I was taking, we were taking theater, real theater to these tiny little communities that had never seen a loud clown before. They'd never seen a theater mm -hmm. show before. And the Canada Council was so impressed that they, that when I applied to, to actually write a, a formal show to tour schools and stuff, they gave me the money. And that continued on for 10 years. I think I got, I got, a, that's how I started my hospital program was because I had this reputation with the unit, Canada Council and I got a senior B grant to, uh, to start the, and then I went down and visited Michael and everybody. And I went to, you know, to France to, to work with Carolyn and Laura in Germany. And that's when I went in Wellington, who I think is, uh, is Wellington on. I'm not sure if he's on today, but thank you to all you people who, who welcomed me. I was kind of adopted by the clown care unit. Um, you know, which yeah. was really, really unbelievable. Uh, you know, they did say, well, why don't you come work with us? And I went, well, you know, you know, I've got a program going in my corner of the world that I think is really, really important. So, yeah. but I have to thank so many people for, for my, uh, for my journey, you know, for yeah. what I've learned and what I've been able to do. But let's, yeah, anyway, so. Let's move on to talk about the, the healthcare clowning. I just want to, um, also just want to clarify, uh, there was a question about officer O'Sneely and, uh, is it Anita, the actual yes. per performer? Anita. Anita Couvret. Anita Couvret. It's nice just to. Yeah. Give her credit because she actually hasn't performed in 30, over 30 years. She became a, a counselor for troubled youth. Mm. Um, just an absolute natural clown. A very French Canadian. She's from North, Northern Ontario. So when I speak, I don't speak much French, but when I speak, speak French, it's with a Northern Ontario. Wow, well, say so. Oh, bon. <laughs> you know, it's with a Northern Ontario accent because she was she was absolutely fluent. So she could play with language. Nice. And, you know, as a clown, you want to play with your mastery of language is is often the ability to play with language. So, you yeah. know, like yeah. you know, I, I mangle where when I became a talking clown, which was when I did my health care clown, that was a talking character. So and I learned how to do that talking character from Officer Sneely because he was ah. just he was just amazing to be honest with you just the best partner in the world um it was like laurel, it was on the level of laurel and hardy she was that good right so i'm just going to give a shout out to anita we've got uh, some great comments coming in here people who don't necessarily know all these stories paul and are like delighted to <laughs> learn about them julie yeah. julie vick says wow first clown recognized as artist <laughs> you think you know someone yeah. well, julie, <laughs> julie lives on bowen island and julie's an amazing musician uh was an amazing musician very <clears throat> pivotal in the canadian music scene uh beautiful herself so i'm very happy that hi julie <laughs> yeah yeah it's amazing right we, we live with some incredible people but we don't yeah. necessarily know all the yeah all the achievements and um, priscilla says sorry just join what year is this well, Priscilla, we are um, we are hovering around the mid nineteen uh, what nineties at the moment. I think in terms of the story. So Paul's 94. just about to tell us um, yep. how how uh, he founded the first clown doctor uh, program in in Canada. So how did that all start, Paul? I mean, you've told us about the inspiration side of it from um, Clown Care Unit in New York, yep. but uh, just fill us in. How how did you? Did you just walk into a hospital and start doing it? What was the invitation? How was this? this what was the setup? Yeah. Well, you don't just walk into hospitals and do it. Uh, <laughs> right. but actually, that's what I did. <laughs> and, you know, the, the, the child life right. staff at Children's Hospitals gives me a hard time. <laughs> but anyway, I'll, I'll back it up a little bit because where serendipity 
jumped in again was when I became, when I went down to Nova Scotia, I drove all the way from the Yukon to Nova Scotia because I had heard when I was up in the Yukon that way, I spent an entire winter up there um, and I uh, heard of a puppeteer. It was in Prince Edward Island, Ron Wagner. And so I thought, okay, I'm going to go meet this guy. You know, this sounds like a person that, that, uh, that could be an interesting person. And I was just you know, out there exploring what was possible. So I drove all the way from the, the, the Yukon to Nova Scotia. But it was, again, it was a, a major year for Canada. There was a, a you know, a, there was the Olympics in Montreal in 1976. So uh, I hooked up with a street theater company in Vancouver that was going to Nova, touring to Nova Scotia, doing street theater. But they had a gig at the, uh, at the Olympics as well. Uh, with one of the theaters that was uh, associated with the Olympics. So they said, come on, come on with us, right? So I hopped in my van, my old truck, and I drove. I, I traveled with them all the way across the country. And the, the, that tour ended in Nova Scotia, in Halifax. Mm. And I thought this fellow I was looking for was in Prince Edward Island, Ron Wagner. So anyway, we did our show in, in uh, you know, in Halifax, in the uh, outdoors at the historic properties which is you know a big outdoor ven venue in halifax and who should walk out of the crowd but ron wagner he had moved to nova scotia <laughs> and he he had no idea of me i had no he says oh you're such a great clown i've just started clowning in the last two or three months and uh, you know I, I, I and i said well i'm i'm staying here i'm looking for i've been looking for you which is <laughs> so weird you know but, but he had he had moved the year before to take uh, to take uh a theater at Wolfville, which is a, a small university in Nova Scotia that has a puppet mermaid theater, had a very well-known puppet theater. And, you know, they did a puppet a festival every year. So anyway, so I, I started living with them and Ron and I, his happy trash picker was a talking clown and me as a silent clown, we just hit it off. Just, it was my first clown duo and it was just so exciting we had and i already knew how to tour schools he'd never toured schools before so we put together a show that could t tour schools and nova scotia had never seen anything like this before so we were very successful we were touring like crazy but what what happened was ron had this 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 uh, this heart he had this heart of service and he had he had discovered that you could talk to kids with puppets in in where they weren't comfortable talking to people in medical situations. So he had approached the child life department. This is 1976 uh, in, in Halifax and said, look, let's do a pilot project exploring the use of puppets therapeutically to give kids information to, you know, to make them comfortable in the hospital and just what, what, we all do as clown doctors now. He was doing with puppets, and he said, "Well, you know, let's let's go in as clowns." And so we did. We went in as clowns, and he did. Pup, he had a puppet on his arm, you know, and uh, he was a very funny talking clown. And and the moment I stepped into a hospital, I felt at home. I knew. I thought this is a place where I don't feel intimidated. I feel like I can. I really can fail here. Like not you have to be really careful. We were we were supervised by child life. So this was this was not just haphazard. Uh, but we 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 started going in on a regular basis. Every week we'd go into children's hospital and he and I would we'd do some duo rooms together and then we'd split off and do solo rooms and it was wonderful. It was so successful. And at one point he said, I wish you'd be clown doctors. What do you think? Well funny bone doctors would be such a great idea. And I went, yeah, that's a great idea. You know, But we both went on to our careers. We both uh, you know we were successful. I started my own company that year. So that that pilot project ended and uh, he carried on working for most of his life with uh, with kidney transplant patients and stuff like that. But I drifted away from it because I had, you know, with Officer Sneely, we created a great show and so on and so forth. So, but every time it always was in the back of my mind, you know, I felt really comfortable doing this. This is, a, this is important work. You know, this is something that mm -hmm. I have the skill to do and I, I, I'm going to pursue this. So whenever I toured, I always would go into old folks homes or I would go into kids hospitals mm -hmm. and just, you know, not for the publicity, just to do it, you know, just to, because I felt it was a creative, it was such a space for me to learn about myself and to mm -hmm. to bring something to that space that was 
that was important and comforting. And uh, so then when I, you know, it just went on the back burner. And then, you know, 10 years later, Michael created the Big Apple Circus Clown Care Unit. And I was not aware of that until about 1991, I'm going to say, when the big article came out in Life magazine about uh, about the clown care. And I, someone from Boston, a friend of mine who works in a hospital there, sent me this and said, you should be doing this. I went, somebody has actually done this. You know, they've, they've created the the methodology to do this safely and to do it professionally. Mm. So uh, I went, I am going to do this. So it took me a couple of years, but I, you know, I was in 1994, 1993, rather. I, uh, I was doing some other thing and I, it was like a 10 minute deliver flowers to somebody, you know, as a clown. And I was, as coming back, I was all in makeup and coming back, I drove by children's hospital and I went, now's the time to make the leap. I don't know where this is going to go. So I stepped into Children's Hospital, into the lobby as my clown, Alexander, my silent clown, right? And oh, wow. Course, really wow. a lot of experience <laughs> with, with, with people and kids and, and being careful, you know, and uh, all that kind of stuff. So I went into the lobby and I went up to the you know, the kids are like, oh, look, clown. And I've, you know, beeping their foot and doing all my silly stuff. But I knew that you just can't walk into that place and do do that you need to be vetted you need to be trained so so but i went up to the desk and i said can you call someone from child life down so they sent down my friend bindi who from child life and, and i you know they told me the story later <laughs> the, the phone call comes like oh my god there's a clown in the lobby uh, they didn't actually have have shrine clowns in the hospital that came in occasionally, and it w wasn't always the best experience. I'll just leave it at that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but anyway, so Bindi comes down, and says, um, "Hello," <laughs> and I said, "Look, I know I can't be here. I just wanted to to come in and say I'd like to make contact with you to see if we can." carry through and we of course weren't in front of the kids then we'd gone into a little corner so they couldn't see alexander not being a clown <clears throat> and she said well yeah sure okay make an appointment and come in as yourself so i did i made an appointment for the next week and then uh, two weeks later they said well come on come on i'm up, up to the wards as your circle as alexander and see how it goes and of course it went really really well so then that's when I, they said, yeah, we're, in. and I provided the documentation from the Big Apple Circus and so on. So they went, well, this is, you know, Christine Pewter was the director at that time. And I have to give her a lot of credit. She doesn't do it anymore. But anyway, so what happened was, uh, was I managed to scrape together the money. I got a, a, sh a short-term grant from the Canada Council. And uh, 30 years ago today, I, I, you know, I, I did again look at books. I, you know, I wanted him, my clown, my clown doctor is, is an old time, He's an old time doctor, you know, he shuffles along and, and, uh, you know, I was doing solo clown. I had no idea about duo solo, uh, in terms of, of, uh, you know, methodology in the hospital. So I, all I knew was that, that it was working for me, that mm -hmm. I had my back covered with child life. They were, you know, I was, I was trained in hygiene and some psychological stuff and, you know, and, and it was a great, very, very tight team in, in those years. Uh, and so they kept their eye on me and I had lots of feedback and lots of, uh, you know, lots of control over what I was doing. But anyway, what happened was I, I, I got the grant, I stepped out and, uh, Doc Willikers was just there. You know, there's the old saying, you don't choose to be a clown, it chooses you. And Doc Willikers, and, and again, I did learn how to do that from Officer. It's kind of channeling Officer O'Sneely in a way. Mm. But it worked out. You know, he was so, this character is a very kind character, very, you know, I'm yeah, I'm in charge. Doc, I'm a doctor of disorder, a D-O-D-O, -D -O, pronounced dodo, not doo-doo, right? So... <laughs> And I have the skills that I brought to it. Was, I have a, I have quite a background in music. I play a lot of instruments, um, but of course the ukulele is the one that goes in the hospital. And uh, mm -hmm. I do magic, uh, just rudimentary magic, but you know lots of uh, word play and, and so on. So it just carried on from there in 1994, and you know I did it for for a lot of years. And I, I I expanded into a Sunny Hill, which is a this the uh, the facility for for um, head injuries, multiple disabilities, uh, autism, uh, you know, near near drownings, all that kind of stuff. And then eventually, I, I well, pretty soon, I, I went into Canuck Place, which is a freestanding palliative care, pediatric palliative care facility here in Vancouver. And at the time, it was the only one in Canada. And I worked there for many, many years as well. And, you know, every day you go in there, it's it's a challenge, especially Sunny Hill. I mean, these kids, I have kid, had kids who were blind, deaf, and autistic. <laughs> 
So, mm. you know, uh, and now nowadays it's harder to incorporate touch into your work, but in those years it was okay. I could touch kids. So, you know, the tactile element uh, was really important for that. And, uh, mm. you know, I, I built up a really a, a great team. My friend, Sam Northrup, who's a really great clown. She came on 20 years ago and uh, she's very gifted as well. And she took over the program when I retired. Uh, and uh, we got Cosmo, Melissa Aston, and Tamara Anro. So there's three clowns now. Uh, and they're working really a lot duo. Um, I mean, I remember when Michael was on, he said, you know, in terms of the, the solo duo thing. Well, you know, yeah, duo is, is fantastic. Solo is fantastic. But if you have a solo program, you can't go to duo. But if you have a duo program, you can you can slip back into solo. Right, right. And you know, that, that's really a, I thought that was an important uh, point to make because they, mm -hmm. my my former program, my program that still continues. Uh, we do they do duo work and solo work because solo is very very valuable when you know when you have a quiet room and and you have some really beautiful beautiful intimate moments as a solo but the you know the duo thing you can fill a you can fill a hallway with harmony and music um you know the, if there's shy children you know to have that other character to break the ice so you're playing back mm -hmm. and forth and then you know relating to the kids who's it like who's in charge no, I'm in charge. No, I'm in charge. And then you ask the kids, well, who, who do you think's in charge, right? So, you know, the triangle, bringing, bringing them in uh, and so on. So, so I support both. And my, my program's gone, gone significantly towards duo uh, because it's... I just uh, work. I want to make sure that we, um, we have time to talk about the puppetry because we've, we've well, only got like 10 minutes left. Yeah. And I also want to, I want to make sure that folks uh, listening have a chance to ask questions. So if you've got any questions... For Paul, uh, this is a good point to put them into the chat because we've got about 10 minutes left. So, Paul, um, you know, I'd love to keep talking about the hospital stuff as well, but I wonder if you could just tell us about um, the transition into working puppetry, because I think that's a really interesting link between the skills and technique of being a good puppeteer uh, and the skills that you learned in, in mime and clown. So, yeah, what was what was that transition like? How did you get into doing that? Well, I, you know, it was not instantaneous, but but it it was it's obvious to me and anybody who's ever done puppetry and clown that puppetry and clown are sisters. They really are. Most most professional puppeteers that I know that work certainly in the movies and stuff, they've done mime training. It's it's essential mm -hmm. because you know what 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 makes puppetry work is not that the puppet goes all over the place. The puppet goes it stops and eye line. When you're working on a on a in a on a video screen, eye line is everything. So here's the pup, here's the puppet, right? And it goes, ah, huh, huh. You think that? Yeah, yeah. Oh no. De, de, de. So it's all it's all very methodical. I mean, you add dynamics and you know, all all that kind of stuff to it. But 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 really they are very, very, very similar. And of course, puppetry in the hospital is just so valuable. You know, you, you every every little kid's got a stuffy at the bedside, and you know, with permission, you pick up that stuffy, and you can make that stuffy talk, and then all of a sudden, you have a whole other story going on, and it's the story of the imagination, you know, and so puppetry just served me so well in the hospital. But how I got into it was because of Ron Wagner. I mean, I, I went down to Nova Scotia. He was a very gifted puppeteer, and his wife Cheryl. Uh, she worked on the original Fraggle Rock um, in Toronto and, you know, Henson. So she's working right with Henson. She did the right hand, his right hand. And he's got the left hand there. And uh, he's, you know, in the puppet. And he's doing the, you know, the the right. No, he's got the left. He's got his right hand in the puppet. He's got his left hand in, in the puppet hand. And the right hand is somebody else's hand. And that was my friend Cheryl. Wow. Right? So, and, and we have, you know, and many people, you know, all the people that I worked with later in life, they were on that show. And so I was uh, living near Toronto at the time when Fraggle Rock was. So they, and you know, I, I already knew puppetry was very handy. I used it in my stage show sometimes. Um, and, I, you know, I hadn't, I hadn't started doing th therapeutic work at that point in time. But I did visit the set in Toronto a few times and realized, oh, wait a minute, this is a whole other world because you're working in a monitor, okay? You're working close-ups. Eye line is, is absolutely important. They, mm -hmm. they, they change the shot by, you know, two feet. You've got to remember what you've done. And, uh, you know, I'm not a vocal puppeteer, which was limiting for me. I don't do voices. Mm -hmm. But what I did was I did, you know, I did, I could do, uh, I could do the, the actual movement. So 
Uh, so I realized that I, I could do this. And I was in the, the actors union, the television film actors union, right from the word go, right from the moment I hit Nova Scotia, I was asked to do a TV show as a clown. And so I got into the union right away. So there was no problem being a full union member, which gives you access to these jobs. But, you know, my resume, I had no resume. So I, I was, uh, I didn't audition for Fraggle Rock or anything like that. You know, I had no confidence in my puppetry uh, because these were really professional people. And, but when I moved out to Vancouver in, um, in 86, I did the World's Fair here in, in Vancouver in 1986. And my parents were quite elderly. So I moved back to, to Vancouver. That's when I moved to Bowen Island here. Uh, and Vancouver, the, the, the film and television scene was just burgeoning at that point in time. So I put down on my resume, yeah, I'm a puppeteer. And I get a call to do, uh, uh, it was a kid's, big kid's production. Mm. Uh, and I went in and I went, okay. And I, I was jumping in the deep end because, you know, the, the controls, I mean, you have animatronics, you've got hand, but you've got gimbal, you've got gimbals. So you're operating with, with these levers and stuff like that. But wow. uh, where, they, where they put me was... Um, doing head and the neck movement. See, when you've got, you know, the puppet, you know, you've got four people working on a single puppet. You know, one's doing eye blinks. Someone's doing yeah. sip, lip sync. Someone else is doing the, the arms. And then there's the head and the neck, which for a mime, head and the neck is like the holy grail. Because, you know, you know, you can turn your head like this. And that's that says something. You turn your head like that hmm, or like this. No, there's mm. all, uh, mm. with these gimbal you have full full control absolute control wow, and everyone has to be it's it's kind of um uh like the bunraku puppets where you have like multiple people on the same puppet yeah. and they have to be so connected yeah. yeah it's the ultimate team team job because every every puppet i've job i've done there's been at least two if not three or four and i mean i did my big claim to fame was Stargate SG-1, where I did the head and the neck of the, of the, the Asgard character Thor. And that was, there was a couple of other Asgards. But anyway, this is like a, you know, this is a $100,000 puppet, right? <laughs> and, uh, and and I got to do all the head and the neck. Huh? Huh? What? Mm. He was a very, very important character in that story. And that led to doing to doing other stuff. I did, you know, iRobot. I did the, the reindeer in Santa Claus 2. <laughs> When I mean, you see the reindeer going up in the sky, uh, you know, scary movie three doing, you know, crazy aliens and stuff. But mostly I worked in science fiction and horror, which I don't watch actually at all. But but it's just really fun. But but it is always teamwork. You know, it's always yeah. somebody doing the head, someone doing the mouth. Um, you know, and I have worked with Hanson Studios a couple of times, which is just real fun. It's really, you know, it's it's exciting. And I and I didn't get chosen for a couple of Henson shows either. So, you know, I'm I'm a journeyman puppeteer. I'm not a master puppeteer, but I do understand what's going on. And but it's uh, been a career for you for the last several decades, right? Or, or yeah, tw yeah, twenty years. And I still actually from the residuals. It's you know, in my retirement years you know as a performer you don't have a lot you don't have a safety cushion really yeah and, and the residuals from some of those shows um they they do they, they add to my uh my my limited comfort in my yeah, old age <laughs> but yeah no puppetry it, it was a great thing to 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 jump into um yeah but I just got really lucky with it. And again, I had the skill from and the skill. I have to go back to the timing of being a clown. Like you need mm. timing, uh, but you need the physical ability to to clearly to, to really to 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 animate an inanimate object clearly and to bring life into an inanimate. And it's so exciting to do. I love puppetry. Yeah. You know? I was, a great, it's a great wizard wizardry skill. Yeah. Um, so there's a couple of great questions here, Paul. I thought we could finish on. Uh, sure. Trilby uh, says, can you recount a great memory from your hospital experiences when you walked out thinking, wow, that was impactful? I'm sure there's lots of memories. Can you, yeah. can you choose? Yeah. Can you pick well, one? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, there's so many. And Trilby, yeah. you know, you work in hospitals, so you know, you know that every single moment in there is a magic moment. Even when you feel like you haven't succeeded, you know. Like mm. the thing with, with hospitals, when someone says, kid says, no, I don't want to see you, that's a success in the hospital because you, you you know, you honor their their request. And, you know, yeah. the little the little wave, little tiny little, you know, and the next time you come around, maybe they invite you in. 
maybe they don't, but usually they do. Uh, but no, but the, one of the most moving moments for me was uh, I was, this was in my really early years. There was a teenager and I love working with teenagers. You know, so there was a teenage girl from up north. So she was in a really formal environment and she'd been in the hospital, uh, you know, suffering from cancer for a long time. She was there a year. And then I came along, you know, I would come every time that I came in, I'd come around to see her and her mom was usually with her. And I could tell one day, you know, and it was an isolation room. So you have to really, you have to get all gowned up and, and, and you know, all that stuff. So it's quite, quite challenging uh, to do that. But anyway, I got all gowned up and came into the room and she was so sick. You know, she was not going to make it. And we all knew she wasn't going to make it. And so I started to try and get something going with her. And she says, Doc, you know, I really love you. But could you just make my mom laugh? She, you know, here she is at the end of her life, um, at 17, at 16, you know, and, and who was she thinking of? She was thinking of her mom. Mm. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. You know, that kind of thing, you just can't put a price on that kind of thing. I was, I, I, I get choked up uh, even now when I think about the generosity of that child and the wisdom of that child, you know, mm. uh, just mm. make my mom laugh, you know, and, and uh, that kind of stuff happens all the time you know it's, Trilby it's, says um oh goosebumps trilby thanks for that thanks uh, for a great question as well and a great answer paul um there's another maybe a final question here paul that um i think relates to the puppetry although it could really relate to anything of yours chris mm -hmm. f says how much plot did you tend to prepare in advance and how much was improv Okay, well, improvisation, that is my strong point, is, is, is because when you go in, and it, it, you know, it depends. Uh, if I'm working as, as an entertainment clown, there's much more preparation because I'm doing a stage show. But within that stage show, there's always, always, I, it, you know, there's always room for improv. Improv is got to be built into everything, was built into everything I did. Yeah. In terms of the hospital, you know, improv is so important, but, uh, you know, you don't go in there with an agenda. You don't go in there thinking, I'm going to do this because it's not presentational. It's a conversation. So what you want to do is you want to find something. And, and it could be a challenging room with, you know, four different kids in the room, uh, totally different ages, totally different comfort zone for uh, seeing a clown and stuff like that. So you have to have your antenna way, 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 way out. So you, if you have an agenda, then you're pushing something into that room. You're not you're not going into that room and, and absorbing what's there and, and and playing off what's 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 happening so imp i don't have i have a few things in my pocket that i can do like i'll come in and start ta i'll come in and say you know look i i heard angela was in this room but i don't see angela and they go oh, i'm angela you know it's like no 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 angela has long hair and she's got a braid and she got you know and you describe the girl that's in front of you and like, that's me that's me so you've already got a conversation happening right and and you know, and if I have, I often, you know, in those years you could do bubbles and I do bubble magic. I can pull a bubble out of the air and make it vanish and stuff like that. You know, so uh, I have tricks in my pocket. I have things mm -hmm. that I say and things that I do that will just jumpstart the conversation. But, you know, to, and somebody, and I, I'm not sure who said this, empty pocket clowning, but empty pocket, you know, sometimes you just got to take everything out of your pockets and go in there. And it's so scary to do that. But, mm -hmm. it, you know, it, it, it's so important because you're not there for you. You, you leave your ego at the door, you know, and, and, and uh, you know, it's going to be there if you're just there to be, if you're just present. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, improvisation is so important. And just leave that agenda and leave your ego out. Yeah, beautiful. You know, and have a few things in your pocket to be sure. Like, you know, there's a couple of things that you, you, you can't go in there with no skills. You need some yeah. skills. Yeah. But you don't, you, the skill that you depend on the most is the skill to listen and to react and, and to create curiosity and just a, a play conversation, basically. So you servant's are. Heart. I have to say servant's heart before I leave. My friend David Langman gave me this gift. He said, to work in hospitals, you need a servant's heart. Yeah which is where the ego goes. It goes out the window and you are Great, saving. David, thanks for that. Yeah. So you are um, a thrift store clown and an empty pocket clown. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's they, not much to me, really. <laughs> well, there's a lot to you. And in fact, lots of people uh, have been commenting. Um, so for example, here, uh, I hope you do a part two with Paul. And um, 
Trevor says, so great to hear about your journey as a clown. And now I find out you have sci-fi experience. My mind is blown. <laughs> yeah, and... Trevor lives on another small island and he's, yeah, he's a great juggler. And he makes beautiful hats. Clown so hats. many people are asking for more for part <laughs> two from you, Paul. Um, okay. And uh, uh, David says, this was one of your very best interviews. Thanks, guys. Paul. I've done 80, 85, so that's that's pretty high praise. <laughs> <laughs> I'm flattered, you know, especially since I've been out of it for quite a while. I feel pretty distant from the from this work, but it's just so much a part of me, you know. I'm so glad to have been lucky enough to be. It was the golden age of theater for young audiences. It was the golden age of clown coming of age in Canada yeah. for sure. Uh, you know, and to be have been most people, I, I'm under the radar. Most people, because I did kids stuff. You know, you go to festivals and people wouldn't know who are you, <laughs> right? But it didn't bother me, you know, because I had my I had that child there, and that child knew who I was. Right? Yeah, so. and now in this community, you're a celebrity. So look at that. <laughs> well, look at this international. Look at yeah. me. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Paul. And I would love to have you back at some point sure. so we can fill in all the all the. <laughs> wonderful stories about the the uh, protests in 1968 and yeah. all the rest of it yeah um, it's been a real pleasure having you on thank you so so well, much for your wisdom and knowledge and experience uh it's very inspiring that word, that word always scares me wisdom <laughs> yeah well, yeah. Uh, well anyway thank you. thank you thank you barnaby you're doing a great service here and, and you know you've brought so much into our homes thank you thank you thank you you're welcome. Thanks, Paul. See you again soon. Bye-bye now. Bye. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for another awesome conversation. Yes, wasn't this one of the best ones? I think so. Um, just to remind you, Hilary Chaplin has an amazing masterclass, Emotional Play, Mind the Joy of Big Feelings, coming up on April the 6th. And you can find a link to sign up for that at the very, very top of this chat. So why don't you go on there and check it out and join us? If you're one of those people that thinks clowning can't happen online, why don't you give it a try and find out before you dismiss it? Because I'll tell you every single month, in fact, every single week, we have amazing transformational experiences and moments on Zoom with clown. So please join us for all the clown stuff coming up, clown spirit village, another conversation next week. As always, thank you so much for joining us and keep clowning. Bye for now.